That's you want awesome. to say something real quick, Karen? Want to tell us about what happened? Well, I honestly took your advice. When we had that discussion at the table, um, at the food area, I took your advice, you said, to be open and to not think about it too hard. And you did mention about online dating. So I went and I opened an account with Match. And I didn't quite like what I was seeing on Match. So it was uh, another sister app, which was which is called Stir. And Stir is for, uh, you know, eligible bachelors and females with children. So single parents pretty much so i went on star and had a couple of hits and i was like mm, 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 mm. but i can't remember and stay up and the right one is gonna know who you are and that uh that whole spill that you gave me at the table so i got a message from him and i went back and read his profile and in reading his profile i started to ask myself well is this a person that I can see myself with? You know, um, does he look like he might be the family type, the dad type to my daughter? All of that. Just because reading the profile, you know, they can say anything. But what are you saying as I'm reading the profile? What What is it actually saying to me? So anyway, he reached out. I responded. We started talking January 12th. The 15th was his birthday. We went out on the 17th. And after that, it was amazing. <laughs> so he um, he, he told me he wanted to meet my pastor. A couple of weeks ago, he came, met my pastor, recommitted to the Lord, and started making like drastic changes in his life. Like I was like, wow, I, ain't, I didn't even, you know, think anything of the changes that he had to make as being big things, but he said that those were small things that because of me and because he thought that I was the one for him, that, you know, he made made some changes in his life. And um, yeah, we were like, oh man, this is really happening. So he's from Barbados, which is totally dope. <laughs> um, and yeah, he proposed last night, which was, <laughs> oh. yeah okay. so I told him I said well now that we are engaged I would prefer if he came up with a date as far as when he wanted to do nuptials because I wanted to remove myself like emotionally or from a fantasizing aspect of it and um, just you know let him lead so he called up my pastor and he was like, um, are you available for the 12th? So <laughs> I will be getting married on the 12th. Uh, it's, it's going to be a simple ceremony. And then, well, as simple as I can get it, because I'm never simple. But um, <laughs> the official wedding will come after. But he's already talking about buying a home and making major moves so it's important for us to at least have that taken care of first and foremost so we can you know merge lives merge accounts talk about all this, you know the major stuff and then we'll do an actual ceremony and reception and i'll let you guys know because i want all my people's there <laughs> be yeah to be here. yeah Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And, and the, one of the major things that you told me, you said the right man will wait for you without you having to put it out there. You know, what are your standards or whatnot? And that was one of the major things I liked about him. He was like, I don't, I don't want to overstep your boundaries and those boundaries, especially where intimacy is concerned. He wanted to wait until after the fact. And I was like, yes, I found he found somebody who was willing to wait. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Major, it's, it's exciting. 
That's cool. cool. Awesome, awesome. See there? There you go. All there right, I go. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry to interrupt. Yeah. No, no, that was that was worth the interruption. Where I, well, for one, I'm glad you were able to get in this time, Karen. I know. I have not been able since we left that event. I have not been able. So every time I hit on the link, it would say Zoom on my screen, and then it would just go blank. And then I go back to it, Zoom again, and it just go blank. Like it's it's not actually letting me pass that. So just now when I hit on what Jeff sent me. It did the same thing and I tried it the second time and then it, it sent me to where it says that uh, the meeting is in progress and it started swirling and then it connected. And I was like, oh, here I am. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you got, you have to share that news with us. I see, I see. That is really and good. Prayerfully, um, well, I guess we can't before another series of meetings before I actually will be married but i was thinking prayerfully at some point we'll come on together and you know have him share i guess to encourage those who are waiting that it is possible because neither of us thought that we would you know it was like i'm i'm over this dating thing i'm done with it and, you know whatever he was too on his end so when we connected it was like oh yeah this this is why i was done because the right one was not where I was all along. I had to be at the right place at the right time. So, yeah, that was crazy. That is awesome. And um, I did hear that the advice helped, so that's great. <laughs> but what, what everybody heard what Karen says, be open. Be open. Yes. It it did it helped a lot. Um, it helped a lot. I even went back um to my Instagram page where he said to take your your pictures, your personal stuff down that you don't want the wrong people attracting themselves to. I even went and did all that. I was like, okay, let me take it down. I don't want all these other guys in my inbox and this that, and the other. And so once I did that, I started to, you know, see a different approach. But the whole star thing, it happened quick. And when it happened. He was like, okay, why are we on there? Because I was getting ready to close it and he was getting ready to close. He was like, let's get off. We have, we've already found each other. At 54 and 46, it's like, you already know. So, yeah. And that's why you guys got to clear your stuff out. I've been talking about that. Some of y'all been doing it. Some of y'all know y'all holding on to junk and y'all know y'all got to release it, you know, so God can make a move. But I'm excited for... You, Miss Karen, I'm excited, excited, excited. And like I said, we love to see wedding pictures, engagement pictures, send them all here. And we one day will get Mr. Sean Williams, who's awesome with the computer, to maybe even make a little website collage or something where we're going to put all of them up to show what God is doing. Hey, Karen, I would love to do that. I can make y'all a little wedding, I can make y'all a little wedding website. I I actually would would love that help, and I'm in the I'm trying to find a photographer because it's sort of short notice. I where where, are you, find where a are you located? I'm in Georgia. Which part? Um. Well, I'm you're in right? Riffin, but the wedding is in Riverdale. It's in Riverdale, like my church. Okay, so you're in the Atlanta area. Yeah, Atlanta. I tell you what, we'll get offline, we'll set up a date, I'll bring my camera, we'll come take some pictures, and then we'll do a little wedding um, website. No for you guys. Now, now, listen to me carefully. Karen, listen to me carefully. I'm going okay. to do this for you. Go and ahead. in return, you and your fiance is going to give CSC a nice little video testimonial type documentary for about 20 minutes. Good. We're good. All right. Even even without the photography, we're good with that because it, it it's a testament to what God did because I could not have done it and he could not have done it separately. It's, it's God actually did that. So, yeah, I'm open to that. All right. I'm going to put my email in the chat. Send me an email and then we can go ahead and get started and get that set up. All right. Okay. Cool. Beans. All right. Congratulations again. All right. Thank you.
Okay, that was awesome. Great timing too. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna go ahead and share the presentation. All right. So I anticipated that uh, it might be a lot for everybody to kind of share last minute. So I did put together a little um, summary of what we covered before. And um, so first one was what is emotional intelligence? And that's just knowing, understanding, acknowledging, processing your emotions. Um, it seems very simple, but we're kind of socialized to suppress our emotions. And um, so it's simple until you start actually consciously doing it and then you realize how much you don't allow yourself to uh, express, feel, um, and, and understand about your own feelings. And then also, it's also uh, acknowledging the feelings of other people. So not just everything that's going on with you, but then also seeing outside of you how other people are experiencing things, especially when it comes to how you are relating to them, how you're communicating with them. And then um, being able to process your those feelings without judgment. So not feeling bad about how you feel or even necessarily uh, feeling good about it, but just actually experiencing those things for what they are and understanding why you're having the feelings that you're having. Um, so you're able to understand yourself better. Okay. So part three, um, we're going to focus on change today or how to change. So it's once you start to connect to those emotions and sit with them and understand yourself better, there may be things that you realize about yourself that you don't like um, as far as, well, I don't like how that affects me or how this thing controls me or how I'm fine until such and such happens or so-and-so walks in the room and then I have a reaction I want to be more in control of my my feelings, my emotions, my choices, because your choices come out of how you feel about things. So, well, where do you start with that? Because you're already kind of digging in far just to even follow what you're feeling and why you're feeling that way. Now you have to figure out how to change it. And some of those changes are changing things that you have done for a long time. They um, have maybe even helped you to get where you are. They've served you up to this point. So they're almost like a good friend. <laughs> so you were saying, okay, you want me to let go of that? You want me to step away from that? Um, okay. The thing about it is that when you step away from something or you change something, it's not just removing you. There's something that's going to replace it. You can't just say, I'm not going to do this anymore. That's the problem with diets. You can't say, I'm just not going to eat this anymore. You have to actually choose to do something different. So what you choose to do, how you make that choice and continually make that choice, that becomes a commitment and a habit. So um, what we're looking at in, in this series is that you've decided that you want a different result from what you've received up to this point. Obviously, we're single and we're in here talking about being single. So that's the obvious change that you want to no longer be single. But there may be other things in your life that also fit that bill that also are not necessarily things that you want to continue or have the same result on. But change rarely occurs without provocation. Um, there's a cause and then an effect. So... Um, what you have on the screen is a uh, Psalm uh, 73, one through three. And it's the whole Psalm is awesome, but I just wanted to focus in on the first three, um, the first three verses, which uh, is truly God is good, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So why did I choose this scripture? Because one of the um, reasons sometimes that um, 
we have found in our in our walk is actually seeing other people being blessed in their mess and you're thinking well i'm really doing everything that i believe god wants me to do i'm being obedient i'm you know i've stopped doing the things that i know are, are wrong I'm really, you know, doing all the things that I think I'm supposed to be doing or I believe God is leading me to do. And yet that nothing's changing. I'm not being blessed with these different things. Um, or sometimes it, like it's just it seems like er everything's happening to everybody else and you're just kind of stuck. And uh, so it's hard not to look at that and start to feel like, well, you know, what what am I doing wrong or what's wrong with me? Why is it that I'm not receiving these things that you feel like you um, have done everything right or everything you should do? Um, and they're, they're doing nothing right. And somehow they're, <laughs> they're finding their person and they're getting promoted and they're getting raises and they're buying houses and cars and all these different things that are happening um, and you're still struggling. Um, but wherever happens, you always have to go back to that first part. Truly God is good. And um, so although things may not be happening in the moment, doesn't mean that they're not happening. Well, even though you can't see, let me say it that way, even though you can't see what's happening, as Karen was just saying, things are happening. <laughs> it's just that it, you haven't seen that it happened yet. Um, so don't believe that because it hasn't made itself evident to you that things are not occurring. And so we want to be ready for what God has for us. We want to be in the best position to be good stewards of what God blesses us with. And part of that is a big part of that is our character and how we show up in the world and how we handle situations. Um, and, so we're going to go through some different aspects of change that um, you're probably going to pick up a little bit of all of it that, you know, maybe can be helpful to you. Um, so Second Peter 1, 3 through 8 is truly the foundation of emotional intelligence or emotional quotient. Um, it is the cornerstone of this series. And um, so if you guys have been in many of my presentations, I do, don't like reading to people, <laughs> but I am going to ask you guys to read along. I put the whole thing up here so you can read it. And the reason is because it is like everything that you need to know, really. Um, so his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. So going back to what we were just looking at in, in that Psalm, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness mutual affection and to mutual affection love for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our lord jesus christ all wrapped up in a bow So um, if you're going through this series and you're kind of trying to stay focused or you're trying to reconnect with things because it does, as Lakeisha was saying earlier, it does take you on a journey of thought and connecting to things that you didn't even think necessarily were uh, an issue or were kind of like, okay, I got that checked off the list. I don't even need to look at that anymore. And God is going to stir up in your spirit things that like, no, you can do better in this area, or this is something that's holding you back. And again, emotions not being good or bad, 
but just understanding them and how they're maybe impacting your trajectory or your outcome or your results. Okay. So this scripture, if nothing else, you can come back to, and you can remember that, okay, this is the path I'm on. Uh, adding goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, affection, and that being a final point of love. Not just love romantically, as we talk about all the time, but love of yourself, love of others, maybe even some people that you have written off. You don't have to write them back in, but you can find a way to maybe let go of some of the things that you've held on to from those experiences. Okay. So that being said, um, you may be thinking, okay, this is all good. You know, scripture is good. The word is always good. But how does this actually relate to my everyday life? Like, what am I actually going to be doing? Give me some tangible things I can stick my teeth into. Um, and Again, it's a lot to, to dig into and self-reflect. But um, Anthony Clark, who's a life coach, he um, he has a really great way of looking at things. So um, I have a couple of clips from him. This is the first one. And this one is uh, really on kind of where to start with the change. Oh, wait a second. I just realized something. Wait a minute. I didn't share with the sound. Let me see. Share with sound. There it is. All right. I caught it right before I started. <laughs> All right. You got to stop blaming everybody else and start looking at yourself. Yeah. And so I started doing my inner work. Okay, so what does that look like? Because a lot of people say inner work, inner work, but I don't know what be working in her. You know what I'm saying? You got to tell me what that means. My inner work was to be honest with myself and to look at how I was, how I thought, and to start questioning, is this really benefiting me? Why am I being like this? Why do I act like this? Mm -hmm. And the tendency for a lot of people is to be like, well, that's just the way I am. But I knew... If I stay the way I am, I'm not going to get to where I want to be. Mm -hmm. So I always say, like, to go there, you got to grow there. You're on this level, you're always trying to get to high levels of understanding, enlightenment, wealth, you name it. So how are you going to get to those other levels? They ain't going to come to you. You got to go to it. So I got to expand and get out of my old way of thinking and being. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was a lot. I'm going to play it one more time just so you can catch like the second part because the first part is already a lot but it's quick you got to stop blaming everybody else and start looking at yourself yeah and so i started doing my inner work okay so what does that look like because a lot of people say inner work, inner work but i don't know what be working in her you know what i'm saying you got to tell me what that means my inner work was to be honest with myself and to look at how i was how i thought and to start questioning is this really benefiting me? Why am I being like this? Why do I act like this? Mm -hmm. And the tendency for a lot of people is to be like, well, that's just the way I am. But I knew if I stay the way I am, I'm not going to get to where I want to be. Mm -hmm. So I always say, like, to go there, you got to grow there. You're on this level, you're always trying to get to high levels of understanding, enlightenment, wealth, you name it. So how are you going to get to those other levels? They ain't going to come to you. You got to go to it. So I got to expand and get out of my old way of thinking and being. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, he he slam dunked some knowledge on you right quick. Is a lot of stuff that was in there um, that uh, really kind of resonates with that immediate need of what you need to do. Um, uh, okay, I don't. I'm sorry. One second. So leadership. I got a message that Kenneth couldn't get in. Did anybody else get that, or somebody trying to help him? Okay, Kenneth Stewart. <laughs> if you uh, he RSVP'd. He said he couldn't get in. Um. So the thing that you have to, as as uh Anthony was saying, you have to start with 
the part that you can control, essentially. I mean, he says stop blaming everybody else, but there are there is blame that can be put on other people at times, but you have no control over what other people do. You can only control, you know, yourself. So you have to look at what you can actually control, what you can do, what you can change within yourself to um, prevent maybe some of the things that have gone wrong or and to uh, get better results next time. Like, okay, maybe if I had done this differently or I communicated this way or I had stopped at this point whatever the case may be, but you have to kind of re-examine that and look at what you maybe could have done differently that would have got, would have uh, given you different results. You want to keep in mind um, the scriptures and uh, Anthony's words um, kind of throughout the presentation. So now, of course, we're going to get into the science a little bit. If you're one of those people that thinks that change is too hard or that you're too old to change, I have something for you. And uh, another clip you that um, is uh, Daniel Lane, who's going to give us an overview of the science behind self-change, um, which is scientifically known as neuroplasticity or brain plasticity. For many years, scientists have thought the brain was fixed and hardwired and couldn't change after childhood. But recent research shows this is simply not the case at all, and we know that people's brains can change well into old age. In fact, our brains change every day. Our brains are considered to be plastic or pliable, and this has helped neuroscientists coin the term neuroplasticity. So how does neuroplasticity work? Well, think of your brain as a huge city with thousands of roads and lots and lots of traffic. Some of these roads are faster than others, with lots of traffic moving quickly and easily. These roads with all their traffic represent our established ways of thinking, feeling and doing. Every time we think, feel or do something in the same way, we strengthen this road, making it faster and it becomes quicker and easier for our brains to travel this pathway. But by contrast, if a road wasn't built well in the first place, or becomes blocked or we think, feel or do something differently, we start to use a different pathway. If we keep using that new road, our brains begin to use this pathway more and more, and this new way of thinking, feeling, or doing becomes automatic. In the meantime, the old pathway gets less and less use and weakens. In other cases, it may be possible to repair or rebuild a block pathway. This process of rewiring your brain by strengthening existing pathways, making new ones, weakening old ones, and repairing broken ones is neuroplasticity in action. It is important to understand that neuroplasticity is not good or bad. It is just what the brain does. Neuroplasticity can result in helpful changes, like when a child learns how to cross a road safely, or when an adult learns a new set of work skills. On the other hand, it can result in unhelpful changes in the brain, like when someone develops a bad habit or an unhealthy way of thinking. All right. So, no matter how old you are or how set in your ways you are or how committed you are to certain behaviors or how many times you've tried to change certain things unsuccessfully, um, you are, in fact, capable of limitless change. Um, it is, I mean, all different aspects of how God created us are amazing. But our brain is the most astonishing um, example of his creation as far as not just what we're capable of within ourselves, but the fact that as God created, we have the ability to imagine something that doesn't exist and actually create it in the world. So that being said, your brain is as limitless as the universe. But you must develop the ability to journey into its outer reaches, as in your brain is only as complex as you choose to make it. You have it's just like, you know, your muscles, you have to exercise them to grow them, your skills, you have to um, practice or to educate yourself to be able to be more advanced at what you do. You might know how to do something, but you can do it better. So it's really completely within your control alone 
on how um, far you can go within yourself and within your capacity and your abilities. The limit is not something that's inherent like, oh, you know, this is as much as my family did or my mama or my daddy did or nobody's ever done. You have the capacity to go as far as you are willing to push yourself to go. So um, what does that really mean? Well, it doesn't really matter how big the world is if you don't have a way to get past the block. <laughs> if you can't, you know, it's great that, you know, there's other continents, but if you don't have a boat and you don't have a plane, how are you going to get there? Right? So that's what it means to have that capacity or that skill set, that work that you put in is those are building the bridges towards your ability to expand your um, world and your skill sets and therefore your um, possibilities. So um, it's not just career advancement. It's not just uh, advancing your knowledge of yourself, but also in your relationships. The more you know, uh, the more you grow. Your skill set, your growth determines how far you go in all aspects of your life. And that's within your control to decide how much investment you want to put into yourself. Um, the investment in yourself always pays back in dividends. Um, but too often we put a lot more of our energy into others and not enough into us. So I just have like, um, again, just some science for you just to to kind of double down on how um, vast the ability is. So I'm not going to read the slide, but there's um, 15,000 possible synapses per neuron. Okay. So each one represents the, the connection that your brain makes to do anything. You have uh, an inordinate number of neurons. 15,000 per means that, as I said, <laughs> nutshell, you're, you don't have a limit on what you can accomplish. And we, according to science, generally use maybe 15% of our brain's ability in our you know, regular lives. So there's a lot more that you're capable of. You're not going to like, you know, blow out your brain or anything. It's not going to be a situation where it's too much. Um, you're capable physically and God gives us the capability spiritually. So that just leaves the emotion, which is your area to control and to um, be able to manage and address and upgrade. Okay. So as uh, was was being said in the video with Daniel Lane, they, they used to think that when you were a child, you developed all of these abilities, um, your brain kind of grew to its point, almost like how you, your body grows. And once you become like 20 some years old, then that's it. So you don't have it. This is what it is. It's set. You can't do anything. And then they learned that that wasn't the case. And mainly they learned that because of what they saw from trauma. So someone that had gone through a brain injury or some maybe even emotional uh, injury where their brain was affected adversely. And then that person somehow was able to overcome that. And so that force them to realize that, okay, somehow the brain is healing itself. And so that means that there can be change over the lifetime. It doesn't stop when you um, grow physically, like, you know, to your full height and all of that stuff, the brain continues to grow um, over the entire, your entire life. Um, so the important thing that I want you guys to latch on to for this next part is the fact that what Daniel Lane was saying about the connections that you make are based on your experiences and how you perceive and see the world. So if you had bad experiences as a kid or even as an adult, you have established connections 
that could b- cause you to see the world and to choose to react to certain things in a way that isn't necessarily in line with what's best for you. Um, like not trusting or uh, having a fear of abandonment or um, of someone taking advantage, um, various different things that you can automatically think and then start to go down that road of thought process of protection or fear um, or defense that isn't necessarily appropriate for, for the situation, but it is what you have learned And unless you make a conscious decision to unlearn it or change how you respond, you're going to continue to respond that way. Okay. So that being said, oops, um, I'm going to focus in on emotional brain damage. Okay. And that essentially, as I said, it can come from childhood of having, you know, bad experiences, um, from abuse all the way to just neglect or abandonment, like a parent just didn't want to be a part of your life. Um, Sometimes it's uh, older sibling bullying. It can be a variety of different things that we too often minimize or marginalize, like, oh, that's just life. You know, uh, older siblings always, you know, haze the younger ones. Sometimes it can be really traumatic for those um, younger children to be to go through those things. Sometimes it can be really nasty. Um, Or you maybe were bullied at school or um, you just had a bad relationship with one of the parents. They maybe were heavy handed with the discipline, different things that could have happened. But also, and we've heard this talked about quite a bit in the group there could have been a situation where you had a really deep connection, relationship, marriage um, that didn't go well. And it has impacted your relationship since. And you may see it as a survival tactic. And so you're feeling like, you know, I'm not going to ever let that happen to me again. I'm doing this now. I, I don't care. But you can still protect yourself in a healthy way. So recognizing that how you're handling or managing things and how that may be impacting your relationships moving forward, um, that you're technically, if you're doing certain things, you might be making the, the new person pay for the wrongs of the old person. And so they may be a great person, but, you know, they're only able to, to, to do what they can do. They can't fix what the other person did. Um, so that being said, you can, um, you can think that your brain is fine, that everything's, you know, and, and it's just everyone else. Everybody else is crazy. I mean, we've heard that from people sometimes like, you know, these men out here, these women out here, um, But what I put on the slide is kind of an extreme example just to show how the brain is impacted. And therefore, if the brain is affected, then everything, all the thoughts, all the emotions that come out of that are obviously going to be impacted. But I also wanted to show that regardless of how much damage occurs, no matter how hurt you are in any situation you're still trying to work through, there is light on the other side. You can heal from what happened um, emotionally and it does impact your brain and your psyche to be able to do things in a better way, to remove those connections that are not serving you in your brain and form new ones that can be helpful and healthy for you, okay? So there, that's not to say that, you know, it has to be something extreme. It's, I used an extreme example just so you could see it, but there could be little things that, I mean, a few of you guys have talked about things that you've started doing differently just because you've chosen to see it differently. Um, And therefore it has developed in you a comfort that you didn't think you'd be comfortable like walking up to a person you never met before and speaking to them or even coming out to some of the events that we have or coming here or sharing things that you didn't think you would share 
those things are all part of change and choosing to do something different. And it it's an outward action that forms an inward connection and change and reinforcing more positive uh, aspects or views of the world. So um, the most important thing to take away is that same thing we talked about last month, avoiding your emotions, especially if they're negative ones, just magnifies them. It doesn't seem that way. You might be able to do it for a while, but it is there. It's, it doesn't go away because you don't acknowledge it. It's there and it, it will intensify over time and it will affect your choices regardless of whether you realize it or not. Excuse me. And it can actually cause more damage to occur. So if you've ever dealt with people who will say that, you know, that people are always, um, sometimes our actions can elicit certain reactions from people and we're seeing it as them doing things, but we're creating the dynamic that causes that result. Okay. Like if you're, um, uh, I think Sean, yeah, Sean has talked about this before where, if you're dating someone who doesn't trust you and they keep, you know, questioning and challenging and they don't trust you and they're accusing you of cheating and they're accusing you of doing things, then at a certain point, some people will actually just go cheat and some people will just say, you know what, I really like you outside of this, but this is taking over everything else. And so I can't do it. And um, so that that person on their side of it, they're feeling like it's them. They're doing this, these things. And that's what went wrong with the relationship. When in fact, it was their overprotection of their uh, heart, their feelings that caused this person that might have been a great person to end the relationship because they just couldn't deal with it anymore. Um, or they couldn't be happy because they were constantly trying to defend themselves against something that they hadn't done. Um, so just in a nutshell, if you're looking at yourself or you're looking at other people that you're dealing with and trying to understand the damage, the emotional damage manifests as irrational fears, uh, negative self-talk, like saying negative things, like a negative dialogue in your head about, um, you not being good enough, or every time you make a mistake, you're feeling like you, I knew I wasn't going to get that right. Or things that are really telling yourself that you're not good enough. You're not worthy. You're, um, a screw up or whatever, um, despair, depression, suicidal thoughts. And then when you look at the relationships that people get into, they can often be codependent, um, or even toxic. So um, if you're seeing those things, <laughs> you don't, I won't say you can't, you know, not be friends with a person, but I would not get into a relationship with a person that are exhibiting those behaviors because they need to do some, as Anthony said, some inner work. <laughs> they need to work on some things. Otherwise, it's going to end up po possibly causing you damage in trying to help them, almost like trying to save a drowning person at a certain point. If you have may have to choose to let them drown to save yourself because a drowning person can actually drown a person who's perfectly capable of swimming. So I know that was a lot. <laughs> it was a lot of information. And um, so you may be thinking that, you know, all of that sounds good. You know, I'm not a sciencey person, though, to shine. So can you break this down? Like, how do I change again? What are you saying? Um, especially, again, if what you're doing, because there's maybe some things that you do or have done that you know, okay, the reason why I'm okay is because I do this. I know everybody thinks that it's not good or you may even just know in yourself, like, it's not the best thing, but if I didn't do that, then I don't know if I'd be here. I don't know if I'd be okay. I don't know if my mental would be right if I didn't make these certain choices or do these certain things. But um, 
there can be a healthier way to still get that result and not do it to the extreme that, that it may be or um, in the manner in which it's done now. So um, you have to remember, as we said at the beginning, change rarely occurs without a cause, it's cause and effect. And so if you're seeing, even in yourself, nobody's ever said anything to you, but like Lakeisha was saying earlier, you're sensing in yourself or you're recognizing in yourself that, you know what, I could be, I could do better with this. Or you might've had a conversation last week, last month, and you're like, you know what, I got the result that I wanted, but I don't feel good about how I got it. Like, I don't, I don't like how I represented myself. I don't feel like God would have been proud of me in that situation. So we can go back to Mr. Clock and, um, He's going to give you an analogy that I think is awesome. Um, you, uh, your, your process in changing is first looking at your life and deciding whether you're ready to change. Because even though you might see that you need to change things, that doesn't mean you're ready to change it. Um, and so therefore that's the decision that you have to make. It's just like, you know, what they tell people when they go to rehab or whatever, just knowing that you have something that's not healthy doesn't mean that you're ready to change what's not healthy. Okay. And, um, usually being ready has a lot to do with being tired of continuing to get what you always got. If you want different results, then you have to change the formula you have to change the input to get a different output okay so let's listen to anthony's analogy so i compare it to a pantry cabinet and everything in that pantry cabinet has been there throughout my entire life the salt shaking these are all my beliefs all the things i was programmed to be in this and that but it wasn't working for me mm. but i didn't really realize it then one day there's this traumatic event the marriage, the divorce, the shooting, where there's an earthquake and everything gets knocked over. Mm. And so that's the breakdown. Now you lose your identity. Who am I? Like you, it forced me. Absolutely. That catharsis, the system breaks down when it takes too much pressure. Mm -hmm. Eventually it's gonna break down. But it breaks down to give you an opportunity to rebuild it back even better. So with my catharsis, it was like, okay, what most people try to do is to go back to what they were. Mm -hmm. So let me put the stuff back in here but you're gonna get the same life again. So I was like, you know what? No, this is a great opportunity. I have the opportunity to, now to create the life I wanna live. Mm -hmm. I wanna be who I wanna be, not because of what other people expect of me. I'm gonna be my true self. I'm going to spirit mm. within. Yeah. So that connection, because that's the internal guidance system where everything you need, all the answers, it's gonna come from there. God, whatever name you wanna call it. Mm -hmm. So most people are trying to get it out there. It's not out there. There's nothing out there. Right. there. It's in here. Mm. So if you don't go within, you will go without. I mean, guarantee you i like that so what i started doing was was i started putting this pantry back i wasn't trying to recreate the same one i wanted to create a pantry that i loved a pantry that i was proud of and so i'm putting stuff back like what is this dude this shit ain't good i don't need that let me throw it out of the way what right, is this right, oh right. this is oh i don't need that what do i want there i want this there i want that there so when i was done i rebuilt this amazing pantry cabinet an amazing life that i loved and so the marriage and that, I did the same thing with each situation. And I came back better and stronger. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. So, you want to have a cabinet that you're proud of or a pantry that you're proud of. Um, and that's really just about all the things that you choose to have in your life and removing the things that I mean, he, the, the, the sniffing <laughs> and smelling something bad is a perfect example. It's things in there that, you know, you need to clean that refrigerator out. You know, you got some stuff that's growing in there that needs to be thrown out um, or that is um, just not good for you anymore. It might, it might be something that served you before. Or that you could do before because you were young and you had different goals, different objectives. But, you know, if you want to be healthy, you can't um, keep eating the same unhealthy foods. You have to, you know, choose to throw out the unhealthy things and um, replace them with 
you know, good green leaf vegetables and fresh fruit and lean meat and all of those different things. Um, and that is a process. It's a journey. It's a process. But um, again, investing in yourself, it pays dividends always. There's always a return on the investment in you. There's no better place to invest your best but in yourself. It blesses you and it blesses everyone that you come across, whether they're in your life for a moment in a line or for a lifetime. Um, so here's 15 strategies for positive change. So these are 15 things that you can do that um, actually will kind of step you through making changes in your life. So some of this we talked about already. Don't look at your feelings are good or Excuse me. Observe the ripple effect means observe how not only it affects you, and therefore, now, because I'm feeling this way, I am talking to people this way. I'm doing these things. I'm making these choices. Um, and possibly even when you're dealing with a person, if there are others involved, like they're witnessing it or they're connected, they it may affect your relationship with them, even though you they weren't part of the interaction with that person. Um Leaning into the discomfort is if it, it doesn't don't don't feel like, oh, well, I don't like how this feels. So I'm just going to avoid it or I'm not going to deal with it. S allow yourself to be uncomfortable because the other side of being uncomfortable is understanding is change. Um, allow yourself to feel what the feelings are in your within your body. We talked about that uh, last month. You're, you have physical responses to your emotions. So when you're recognizing how your body reacts to your feelings, then you're quick, more quick to recognize it when you're in situations where, you know, you're dealing. If you're on, on your own, you can take the moment and take the time. But if you're in situations with people and you're reacting because you haven't learned how to recognize your feelings, then it's only half done. So meaning that, well, I know what I, I know what me being angry looks like. I know how I act when I'm angry, but if you are in a situation and you're not taking that into that and saying, okay, I, I feel myself getting angry. I know that if I don't remove myself or I don't do X, then I'm going to respond in a way that I don't want to respond. That's that's the key. That's like the test. It's one thing to, to be on your own and recognize things, but being able to, in the heat of the moment, whether it's anger or sad or whatever, being able to pull yourself back and not just react to the stimuli of whatever's happening, that's the test of how much control you actually are uh, asserting over your emotions. Um, so right there with that fit, no one pushes your buttons. So um, we talked that first, what was it, January, about how there may be people in your life that know exactly what to say or exactly what to do to get you there. Like, I want them to do this. So, or if you're maybe doing something that they don't want to deal with, don't want to recognize, they know what to say to get you off of them. They know how to get, to deflect. They know how to um, distract you. And it's all about you being reactive and they're, they're, the buttons being pushed. And um, sometimes, and I learned this from my personal experience, sometimes we unwittingly can trigger people that then their reaction triggers us. So sometimes, and because you see them like not being that way with other people, but it's the dynamic you have with that person that causes this, this toxic situation. 
um, watch yourself. So um, pay, pay attention to how you're reacting to things, how you're um, how you maybe are overreacting or are disproportionate in what in your response. And try to be objective, like if if it wasn't me and somebody did this or if it was done, if I was on the other side of what I've done, would I feel the same way? Don't don't. It's just you. So you don't have to defend yourself in your own mind. Just be objective and and set set aside your own opinion um, from your perspective and try to see it from the other person's perspective. Um, we talked about journaling. Uh, so don't be fooled by a bad mood or a good mood. That's about. Well, just because you feel that way, don't don't not think past that. Like, okay, I feel bad or I feel good, but why do I feel that way? What what's the basis for the feeling that I'm having? And sometimes it, it seems when you when you look at it like that, it seems like an odd question. But sometimes we feel things about a situation that we wouldn't expect. Like getting fired and feeling good about it. <laughs> you know, you would think that it would be a bad thing, but then you realize, you know what? I really was ready to go. And I just wouldn't break ties, but I'm relieved that it's over or, you know, relationship ending or different things like that. Um, and, and again, asking yourself the why, like, why do I um, respond this way? Why do I feel this way or not feel that way? Um, why do I see it differently than what others seem to think I should? And um, visiting your values is basically comparing how you feel to what you believe or what you you know think you believe. And um, the way that you can do that is you write down what your values are. And then what you've done recently that you're not proud of. And then um, see how they're aligning up or not lining up. Because too often we have in our mind a picture of the person we want to be, but our actions aren't necessarily consistent with what we're saying we want uh, to be our value set. And, um, and that can sometimes impact our relationships because we say things, but then our actions aren't showing that person that we are the person we're saying we are. Um, sometimes, and where's Lori? I know she's going to laugh at me. Uh, the television, movies and books and music, um, I, those that have been around know that I like reality TV and this is why I like it. Because when you're, well, some shows I like, you know, the fact that they're helping people get their life back on track and all that. But when you're watching certain things, you're gaining insight on yourself because you're hearing them say some of the things that you say, but you're on the outside of it. So now you're getting a chance to see, oh, this is how, this is what people see when I'm doing that. This is what it sounds like when I'm saying that. Um, and this is how, and you're then seeing the reaction of the people around them. This is, this is how it feels. Now, I, I mean, you know, I'm not, I don't need to tell y'all how amazing God is, but, um, God be cracking me up. So the like 2017 through like 2019, God kept bringing people into my life people that did things that I do, but to a gr like a more extreme degree. So I couldn't miss it. <laughs> like, yeah. So, you know, and so you, you, you see like this, thing, like, dang. And then you make the connection like, oh, I do that. <laughs> That's what I do. Is that how it, is that how people are feeling? Is this what it feels like to be on the other side of me? Um, anybody that has kids, You've definitely had that experience because you sitting there like trying to deal with their stuff. And then you at some point come to like, OK, 
what did I need to hear? Like maybe you did or didn't hear that when you were their age, but you're realizing that you, that you actually are the best person to deal with it because you understand because you thought that way. You remember being like that. And you're like, what did I need to hear that would help me to not do what I did because I knew what I was doing. I had it all together, whatever. But um, but that's what what you kind can sometimes get from movies or or TV or different things is seeing your yourself from the outside, how you're acting, how you're presenting yourself, things you're saying, and what that stirs up in other people. And um, and then recognizing how good or bad that might be as far as the result you may want to have, or if it's actually representing you in the way you want to be represented. Um, <laughs> so the seeking feedback, that's something you want to really try to get with people that you either don't care at all what their opinion is, or you trust them very well. You don't want the in-between for the simple fact that somebody that you have no, you know, like you're, you're almost um, completely disconnected from, like, you know, they, they're going to give you just an honest answer because they have nothing, no skin in the game. They have no, nothing to lose or to gain by saying something that's, you know, not true. Um, and then if you really trust them, then they are, they're going to tell you what they believe is in your best interest, you know, so they're going to be as honest as they can because they, you know, are trying to, to help you. The gray area in between, I would stay away from unless you are really thick skinned. Um, because even when someone is trying to be hurtful, they can still tell you something that is helpful but if you're not thick skinned, don't do it because it's just going to um, it's, it's going to probably do more harm than good. And um, if you try it, you'll find out if you're not thick skinned. <laughs> if you're not sure, sometimes people think they are, and um, and they're they're not. But um, but I would I would try to stay on you know either side of that. Um, um, for for people on the the unemotional side, people that you kind of work with are usually pr pretty good because you know it's just business, so they can kind of give you that feedback. If you have a mentor, um, or if you don't have one, you can get one. They can give you that feedback. That's kind of like unbiased, straightforward, direct. Um, but yeah, people that you um, are dating. Not that you can't ask them, you know, what they think and things like that. But if it's something that you're feeling vulnerable, like you're not ready necessarily to hear just anything that's said, you want to just be careful of who you seek that feedback from. Um, and then uh, the last one, get to know yourself under stress. So... Um, <laughs> most of the things that we like to believe about ourselves are true in the best of circumstances. The key is what happens when things go wrong. That is where we see the parts of ourselves that we don't necessarily like. And it's up to us to decide whether we're going to handle things in a better way and be more consistent with the happy version of ourselves or the um the uh the ver the positive version that we um have when things are going the way we would like for them to go um under stress things can little things can be exacerbated or we can um be the complete opposite of our normal self. Like we can normally be patient and become very impatient, uh, snappy, rude, negative, um, argumentative, uh, isolate ourselves, completely shut down. Um, and the thing about it is 
and this is specifically really critical in romantic relationships. In any other situation, you can kind of go off and do deal with your stuff. But when you're in a committed romantic relationship, you have to be able to deal with stress together. That doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, you're going to be like that, that teamwork thing. Like, oh, come on, we're going to get this together. We're going to get it. We're going to figure it out. That's not necessarily how it's going to go. But you do have to build a strong communication rapport with that person where they know, okay, I know that this is how you react to stress. And this is how I can help to keep you on track because that's, you know, a big part of what stress does is that it kind of throws us off. Um, and then also how you can help that other person. So you guys ultimately, no matter what, you're still working together. You're not pu pushing away from each other or withdrawing from each other and then dealing separately. That is often when you hear about people that like go through a traumatic experience and they end up getting a divorce, like they lose a child or, you know, something really heavy happens. That's usually the reason it happens because they don't uh, work on it together. How they deal with things and they internalize and they um, do what they feel like they need to do to get through that situation. But they, didn't depend on or lean on or lean into that relationship and that bond to get through. And then they know they, they go grow apart. They sometimes can't be around each other because that person just reminds them of the bad thing that happened. So, um, so you, you want to work on being able to, um, still be connected to an, that person in those, in those moments, in those stressful times when bad things happen, um, that you recognize that whatever you were doing before, you don't have to go through it alone anymore. And, um, sometimes that can be, you know, through friendships that you can do that. Um, but the main thing is just not, not having extreme negative behavior when you're stressed out, you know, like, like being really snappy, being really mean, being um, harshly sarcastic, just different things that can kind of come out. Now, um, it doesn't have to be complicated. I'll tell you what I do. I get quiet. Um, and I learned that being pregnant <laughs> because even though everything was fine and my body was like invaded by an alien and I was uncomfortable and I was tired. And, <laughs> and so, um, so I would just, you know, like my coworkers, I just tell them, um, you know, I don't feel great. So it's not you, but I know that if I don't guard my speech, I'll say things unwittingly because I, am just I'm, I'm tired I'm 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 uncomfortable all of these different things um and so that's my kind of way of doing it and I, I do I straight up say you know I'm I just I, I, I don't want to say something I will regret because it has nothing to do with you and I don't want to take something out on you that doesn't belong to you um and then if I do have to communicate I have to talk then I just take my time I don't, I'm not quick to say things because I can be quick to say something. <laughs> if I, I know that about myself. So that's, you know, you knowing yourself, knowing what, how you are under stress, knowing um, that these are weak areas for you and giving yourself the grace to not feel the pressure of being the same person all the time because you can't be the same in every circumstance, but you can learn how to regulate um, the way that you're interacting with the world. So you're not, you know, just spewing all of the things that are inside out on, especially on people who are just like, 
I just wanted to know if you wanted to have dinner. <laughs> wasn't expecting all that. Um, so, uh, um, and then um, knowing how to kind of, you know, bring yourself back. So we talked about that um, in uh, February, um, having different tools to allow yourself to feel what you need to feel. And then also to kind of recenter or reground yourself. Music is mine. And um, so that is one of the things that uh, you guys are going to have for homework. We're going to talk about it next time. Excuse me. Um, so I'm going to put it in the chat for the next event is a song that is what you listen to. I mean, you can have a bunch of them, but I'm just going to ask you for one. A song that you listen to that will allow you to kind of have your good cry. Or you're good, you know, like, I want to rip the world down. And then a song that brings you back to like, okay, I'm in my woosa. I'm like, good. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable. I'm at peace. I feel all is right with the world. And those two, those two songs, I mean, you got, I, got, you got, I got a whole playlist, but those, those two songs, you got to keep in your arsenal at all times because you might have to go into a meeting where you got some stuff they need to know, but you can't say it like that. So you listen to that song where you get all of that anger out and then you go in there and you're very professional and you say exactly what needs to be said in a very professional way and everybody gets the message, but they are not focused on how you're saying things or how you're acting, but what you're saying because you've gotten that emotion out and now you can just say it and be very clear and be very, um, uh, you can communicate well without the emotion because that's what people kind of, they feed off of, whether they intend to or not, they pick up on the emotion. Um, and then, you know, the having having something that can kind of bring you back to center where, especially if you have a negative self-talk issue, you want to have something that reminds you that that's a lie. That's not true. I'm awesome. I am amazing because y'all are amazing. So, um, of course, Lori, I have homework. Of course, I have homework for y'all. <laughs> so... Uh, that journal or that notebook or that piece of paper that you had in January um, and then again in February, here we go. So this ties back to what we we're just talking about with the 15 um, strategies. You want to start with um, your strongest or most extreme opinions or feelings. And um, you're going to become a two-year-old. Anybody that hasn't dealt with two-year-olds, two-year-olds say, why? Why? Everything, every time you answer them, they say, why? Again and again and again. And the reason for that is that you're going to have to dig down into the why of what you have kind of just kind of put a big bow on it. Like, I'm done with that. I know exactly how I feel. I know exactly what I think. If you don't know why you feel that way and why, the as it says on there, um, because it's not a reason, that's just how I feel is not a reason. Um, it is going to likely be because of something that happened or because of someone else. So like if your mom or your dad or somebody else that you looked up to, um, had an opinion or belief or a feeling, um, that they were really adamant about that might be the why or something you experienced might be the why. Um, sometimes it's something that happened before you can technically remember, um, like that age one through five, well, zero to five, um, because we, we remember things differently up until that point. Um, so you may not be able to get fully there, but, um, most things you should be able to, uh, to tie it back to a person or an experience. And then, you're really doing that. The whole purpose of you doing that is to be able to own it, that you're not just drawing in or pulling in things that don't actually belong to you because that 
situation that caused your aunt to feel that way and to be that way didn't happen to you. And it has nothing to do with you. And so is it actually something that you should carry on um, dealing with that, you know, isn't actually your experience? Um, or if it's something that you developed as a child that helped you to get through your childhood, you're not a child anymore. You don't have to live life according to the circumstances in which you're placed. You're the one that makes the decisions now, not your parent or you know guardian or whoever. Um, and so you can choose to now make um, the change to say, okay, I'm in the driver's seat now. So I'm going to give you guys a, a, like a really quick example, and then we're going to be uh, discussing, discussing. So um, I realized in my 40s, <laughs> So uh, I think I just turned 40. I um I realized I went back home. Um God led me to go back home uh to my where my family lives because I don't nobody none of my family lives in Georgia. And it it was I started to have to revisit a lot of things that I hadn't dealt with. Um that was the reason I left. So uh one one thing that I realized was the men that I chose relationship with, including my, my late husband, I chose based on their ability to protect me because I grew up feeling unprotected. And I didn't realize that the entire time, all, you know, whatever relationships, things I was going on, I didn't realize that until I started looking at the people that I didn't choose and why I didn't choose them. And the, despite the fact that they were great guys, there was nothing wrong with them, but I kept coming back to the feeling like they wouldn't stand up for me. They wouldn't defend me. Um, and then I was like, well, why do I need to be defended? Like I'm grown, <laughs> you know? Um, not that that's not, you know, it's not that's it, that you don't necessarily want that, but it's a difference between wanting something and needing something. And I needed it. Why did I need that? Because I still had that part of me that felt like I wasn't safe. And it was because I hadn't dealt with that from being a kid and realizing that, you know, that's over now. I'm not a kid. I don't have to just deal with whatever's happening around me and just trying to persevere. I actually can choose different things for myself. So that's just, like I said, just a quick example of what I um, mean by, you know, understanding the why of things. All right. So let me take my share off. And... Who wants to go first? So Joseph put the recap video link in the chat. Thank you. <laughs> Lori. <laughs> oh man, Denise. Good morning, everyone. I just wanted to say to Sean, this is an excellent, excellent teaching. Um, thank you so much. I saw a lot of me in it um, and learned so much from it. I don't have a question. I just want to tell you how much I appreciate um, everything that you've been teaching, everything that you taught today. I'm looking forward to more teaching in the future. Thanks, Denise. I appreciate that. Anybody else? Oh, Lakeisha. Hey, Tashawn, once again, you got us thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was, there was so much that was said. Wow, it's it's a lot. Um, I really, I never heard of the, the guy, um, the life coach that you had gave his video. 
Mm -hmm. I'm going to go back and listen to his information and probably send a couple friends because there was a lot of things that he had said. You gave us just quick snippets, but there were a couple of things that really stood out for me about the part where um, that you have to grow to where you want to be. Right. If you want, you had to grow there to be there. And that's one thing that God has really been working on me. Um, I just had this conversation with my daughter because <laughs> she was like, Ma, you always doing such such. I said, because I'm planning for where my next. I said, think about it. When you go on a trip, do you, do you, uh, uh, let's say like right now, if I'm going on a trip to Bahamas, it might be cold in Georgia, but I'm packing for that, for where I'm going to. So I'm not going to be taking no park. I ain't going to be taking no long sleeve. I'm taking, you know, swim, swim, swim to and everything else. I was like, so you need to, you know, I keep telling her that. And that's another thing that I have been doing, even though I do may not have it, it don't matter. I'm preparing. I am preparing. I've been planning for things, this, that, and the other. She be telling me I'm extra. I was like, whatever, right? <laughs> because I'm, I am not staying where I'm going to be. I got me. They, they, my sisters and my, my daughter, they're, they're in their thirties. So, so they just, well, my daughter's not 30. She's late twenties, but they still be like, oh my God, you are so, but I'm trying to help them. Because God has showed me one thing in me. Another thing that he has said, there were several things that he said about how, because I've been that person would be like, oh, I'm. this is just how I am. But how I am ain't been working for me. So I obviously needed to change some things, right? So he was talking about the pantry. I was like, ooh, man. I mean, there was so many good things that he was saying. Um, so many good things. You was, I'm like, Lord, the homework, I'm, I'm doing this because I am. Um, I'm truly trying to be, the best me that I can, right? I'm giving to give my spouse the best me. I'm not trying to give him no junk, no mess, no more. I, I've been checked on attitudes. You've been, like I said, there's so much in this series. You done brought about the attitudes. Then I had to start listening because I don't be thinking I have an attitude half the time, but some of my family members be like, well, why you had to say it like that? I'm like, say it like what? And I had to say, you know what? If multiple of them are saying the same thing, then it's me. It's not them. Right. So I had to start checking myself um, in areas. But I also appreciate this teaching because I would have been still somewhere time or whatever. Y'all get over it. This is how I do it. Right. <laughs> but no, I do have to. I mean, I recognize that. No, if that I do have to first work on me. And so that is just the biggest thing I have been working on me because there was something that God showed me last year about, um, you know, the scripture, he, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and finds favor. Well, I'm somebody's favor and I'm somebody's good thing. And I know God only gives good gifts. So that means I need to do what I'm supposed to be doing so that he could um, get his gift to um, to where it needs to be, <laughs> right? Because I could be holding up the process. I, I recognize that. So I do understand, like, like I said, I appreciate this because uh, you always got a sister trying to go do some more work and seeing some things that she need to work on. So <laughs> thank you, girl, for another good uh, lesson. I'll let Sean go on and put his little words in now. <laughs> Let me let me let me say a couple of things about what you said, Lakeisha. Um, one, uh, I don't know if anybody's ever heard this thing about you should dress for the job you want, not the job you have. Mm -hmm. um, same is true in in your life. You should you should live the life you want, not you know. Just like I was saying, you're not a kid anymore. You're in control of your choices and and um the things that you do. And in whatever part of your life you can choose to live, don't wait to live until you have a partner or a spouse. Because mm -hmm. how much of, of what this gift that God has given you, this life God's given you, are you missing out on waiting? Do it now. Because guess what? You might be on First Street waiting and your spouse is in, where can in Barbados? He's not in Barbados, but... <laughs> <laughs> that you you might go on vacation and meet somebody that lived down the street <laughs> you don't know but if you're sitting waiting then you know that that's what you see in scripture all the time and god is just telling people to move and he's blessing them on the journey to where he's sending them the other thing and this i'm sure it's other people too but i'm telling you this lakeisha <laughs> what i had to learn was I'm not thin skinned. I'm very thick skinned. Um, you kind of have to beat me over the head for me to realize that. Oh, you're trying to say something like directly to me that's ugly. Oh, I didn't even realize. I just think you're having a bad day. Ain't got nothing to do with me. But other people who are thin skinned is hard when you're not because you'll say things not realizing how hard it is for a person who you know is sensitive and. 
The other thing is, is that people that are that way, often their voice is more or their 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 opinions they're they're more important to people than we realize. And so I would be in conversations with people and they're saying the same kind of stuff I'm saying but because my opinion matters more I can't say those things because it's taken in a way that I'm just joking with you like you was just joking with me what but that's I mean we have to recognize the relationship that we have with people and, and, and be honored that we're that important. Um, and, you know, just be more sensitive to, oh, okay. You know, so, so I, you know, I've learned not to say things. I mean, sometimes even to my own family where I can't, like you said, like, I can't say it because, well, if I say it, then it means something different than if, you know, this other person says, and they can just make it a joke. So, um, you, you know, have to kind of level set for the impact that what you say and do has on people based on how their level of importance they've placed on you. So, Agreed, because you you know me, you know I'm, my skin a little bit thicker, so I may say something not meaning it, but if they're taking it wrong, I do have to come back and, yeah, I'm learning how to watch my, hold my tongue a little bit. So thank you, ma'am. <laughs> no problem. Go ahead, Sean. You know what, Tashawn, once again, um, your presentations are actually, they, they go a lot deeper than I don't know if we all realize. They're power packed. You know, you talked, there was a, a term in there called synoptic pruning. And I was thinking about that scripture and I had to get it. Um, where God says he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. You know, so pruning and rewiring our brain to form different pathways that lead us to success and to instead of failure in other areas. Like I whole read a I read a whole book about that, even had a mentor that actually, a life coach that actually teaches that. Um, just how to rewire, re recreate those pathways in your brain. He thought of them like, you know, streets that get blocked off or whatever because of construction. And now you have to go down another street. And before you know it, that, that other street becomes the default, mm -hmm. um, you know, out of practicing. So, like I said, that stuff is deep. There's a book by Dr. Maxwell Hulse called Cyber, Psycho Cybernetics that goes into detail exactly about what you're talking about, but it teaches us how to recreate those different pathways that have, um, you know, so that we can have the life that we want. You talked about creating the life that you want. Um, and the bottom line, that's, that's what we're here to do. Um, the other thing you talked about dressing for the job that you want, not the job that you have. I keep remembering that term act as if, mm -hmm. you know, so if you act as if eventually, um, it'll become the default and you'll be there. You know, when you started, when, when you was, I mean, your whole, pre like I said, your presentation is power pack. So I'm going to have to stop myself because I can go on and on and on and on and on. But, um, I was remembering when we went to Stone Mountain. Now, y'all know I got a fear of heights. And we're climbing on the top of Stone Mountain. One, and I know where my fear of heights come from. It comes from being a child going to the top of the World Trade Center as a kid, because in school, you know, in like fifth grade, sixth grade, your school trip was to the top of the World Trade Center towers. And they forced me to go up there. Um, and I was afraid of the elevator. The building started rocking, scared the hell out of me. It's like a horrible experience for me. So I had a fear of heights, you know, but I talked to myself all the way up Stone Mountain to get rid of, not to get rid of the fear. I acknowledged the fear. I acknowledged where it was coming from. And I also acknowledged that this was something that was in my own head. This was not a reality. Yeah. And and literally, I had to talk to myself. You know, I mean, I've once heard the greatest conversation you could have is the conversation that you have with yourself. Um, you know, and then the Bible says in Proverbs, the power of life and death are in your word. 
are in the word, but even in your words, it has the power to create. Um, you can create joy by complimenting somebody, and then you can create strife by cursing them out. Mm -hmm. um, so you can create and destroy with the power of your very own tongue. So, you know, I have to talk myself through it. You know, the, the, when I started dating, some of the fears that I had and some of the, um, you know, the issues that I had in the past, they have a tendency to pop up in the form of fear and insecurity in the future. Mm -hmm. And literally, I have to talk to myself. This is not that person. This is somebody totally different. Just relax, be happy, and just get to know that person for who they are. Literally, I'm, this is on a date I'll be talking to myself mm -hmm. because that person may say something or do something that triggers a response or brings to my remembrance of something that happened in the past with an ex that was like, you know, that was like a horrible thing. So I literally have to talk myself through it so that I don't respond in a negative way and then sabotage myself um, because this person could be a great person, but because they reminded me of this such and such an incident, I can't really get to know who they are. And I'm looking at them through those lenses of past relationships. Um, so I try not to bring my baggage from the past and my hangups and my insecurities into my future and into um, future relationships, but I use, I use that technique of rewiring those pathways in your brain, those synopses and all that stuff that you talked about in order to, like you said, create the life that you want in your future. And again, I can go on and on, but I am going to shut up to Sean. You did an excellent job um, once again. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, the other cool thing about pruning, if anybody that knows, you know, uh, agriculture. Uh, one of the things that happens when you prune is that um, where you have one branch, you prune it, then it actually grows more branches. Healthy pruning, then you're growing, you're you're uh, magnifying or increasing the health in that in that. Okay. Area. Does anybody else have any anything to share? Any thoughts, Faith? Hi, this is my first time. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Hey, you're welcome. Okay. I don't sound very good because I'm fighting off a cold. Anyway, so this is my first time here. And one thing that I really gleaned on was the fact that um, the scripture that was used is actually one of my anchor scriptures, what keeps me going every day. Is knowing that I've been equipped and have been given all power to all to live all, in all godliness and all goodness and like experience the fullness of God and just anchoring myself in his word and having said all of that there's a lot of things that I need to work on because um, somebody mentioned this about um about this being a journey it's not a one time or one recipe fix all type of thing there are a lot of things that I need to work on and it's asking the right questions. So what, why am I, how is this, whatever I'm doing, how is it serving me? Or how are my actions benefiting those who are around me and what kind of ripple effects they have? So those are the questions that I needed to, um, I didn't think about it until I had this session. So this has helped unlock a lot of things that I need to work on, obviously. And um, <laughs> sorry just continue um like improving and digging deep so that I know that um I'm a healthy and I'm, I'm healthy in my relationships with people and most importantly what is inside of me or what has been poured inside of me is able to reflect on the outside and that's basically me just taking the time to do the work Awesome. Thank you, Faith. And thank you for sharing. I hope you feel better. I know how miserable it can be, especially the weather's been like hot and cold and hot and cold. So yeah, we'll definitely be praying that you uh, get better soon. So uh, Calvin, you're very quiet today. I'm not used to this. <laughs> Did Calvin leave? He 
probably spent some more. I think he was trying to unmute himself. <laughs> He'll be back in a minute. <laughs> Oh, does anybody else have anything they want to share? That comes Calvin. Yeah, he must have got out. He must have dropped by accident. Calvin, you got to unmute yourself. He's trying. He looks like. Uh, you might need to help him out. That's them Apple products. <laughs> you know, that iPad. <laughs> I'm with you, Tashawn. <laughs> oh, anybody else want to share? Um, Rachel? There you go. Yeah. Am I that quiet? You said nothing, so that's that's pretty quiet in my book. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you just need to shut up, okay? And listen, but I'm hearing what everyone is saying. I what I do for myself every month, every end of the month, I do a self evaluation. Um, it, it seems to work for me. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I would say it doesn't always work for me, but what I, I like to be in control of everything, well, as much as I can, okay, and, and not try to be too emotional about stuff. Um, what you give me, I give back, <laughs> positive or negative, you know, I deal with the negative. But um, my previous profession taught me a lot of things. Um, patience, listening, and say the first thing that pops into my head. Because a lot of times that's a negative. <laughs> Majority of the time that, that's a negative. But, but just listening, self-evaluation, um, but you do have to, to prepare yourself. Here's a question I got through all this. How does one know when their prayers have been answered? Recognizing it. In a person, because it doesn't always go well those first couple of times. It, it doesn't. Um, recognize it. I'm, I'm looking for a lesson in that. Mm. Well, uh, I mean, whoever wants to, to give their feedback is welcome to. I think uh, I think that's a very loaded question, Calvin. <laughs> <laughs> but what, I, what I'll tell you is uh, my opinion um, when it comes to talking about romantic relationships for some reason want comes up a lot as to I deserve what I want I want this this is my list of things I'm praying for these things and I don't know I just don't see a lot in scripture about God giving us what we want what we need that's all over the place what we need is what I see God being more about is like, you know, this is, this is what's best for you. This is what you need. I know you better than you know yourself. I know your future that you haven't even lived yet. This is what you need. But I think one of the biggest issues that we have in our romantic lives is focusing too much on what we want. And we know scripture tells us that, um, being in God's will is um, not focusing on what we want. And so those things don't really go together. So knowing that your, your prayers are answered, well, you know, what are you praying for? 
Um, and did God just finally say, you know what? You're stuck on this. I'm going to give you what you think you want so you can see why <laughs> I haven't been giving it to you because it's not what you need and it's not going to serve you. And um, you're going to realize and you're going to you know, let it go because, you know, you're you're now having to live with these answer prayers <laughs> that are not what's best for you. Um but if I was to say the simple answer of uh, knowing that prayers are answered in the sense that, you know, if we're in God's will, that it's adding to whatever it is, is adding to your purpose and your walk with God. Um, it's not going to take you off track. It's not going to take you off your path. It's not going to cause you to sacrifice your yourself. You might have to sacrifice some things that you hold near and dear. But you're not going to be uh, uh, taken away from or less capable of serving God's will for your life. You'll be, you know, fortified, supplied, um, blessed, and more effective um, than you maybe thought you could be. and. Usually with me, I don't know about anybody else, but usually with me, it's always something that's like, I ain't see that coming. Like, how how do you um, have a flash flood and nothing is, oh, Donna's not here today. <laughs> how do you have, because Donna had a, a um, pipes break in her, in her apartment complex and her apartment was the only one that didn't get any water damage at all. So it's, you know, it's things that if you told somebody, they're like, that's impossible. That don't happen. And you're like, but it did. So, you know, that's that's God. Yeah, of, of, of course, that's how I see him. I totally agree. And use what he said. Even though there was a tornado watch up here yesterday in Ackworth, you think I didn't use those words? Peace be still? Oh, yeah. Um, and there was a common effect too, but anyway, but yeah, I I I, I agree with you. She gives us what, what we need and not what we want. So go ahead, ladies. I see hands up. Hey, Denise. Hey again. Um, so Calvin, if you're referring to relationships in terms of answered prayers, how do you know? I want to piggyback on what Tishon just said because it triggered. Um, the Holy Spirit brought to mind um, the, the story of Solomon, who I had an obsession with when I first came to Christ. The interesting thing about Solomon is that what he asked God for was wisdom. He could have asked for anything in this world but he asked for what he knew he needed. And God said to him in response, not only am I going to give you wisdom, I'm going to give you everything else in addition to wisdom. I'm going to give you everything that this world has to offer. Um, and he did. He had everything, everything, everything that he wanted, he had in addition to what he needed, which is what he asked for. And so I think it goes back to what Tashawn says, is knowing what you need and praying for what you need. And I think a lot of us don't know what we need. We don't seek God for what we need. We seek God for what we want in a, in a mate. Um, and so once we align our needs, for what we believe what we need with God, God's will and his word, um, and we start praying for that, then not only will God give us what we need, but you'll be um, pleasantly surprised that he also gives you in that same person what you desire, what you want. And I also agree with Tashawn when she said, um, it's 
probably going to come in a way where you just don't expect it at all, at all, at all. And you're like, you're like doing life, doing what you do. And all of a sudden the person shows up and um, you're like, wow, this person is not only what I needed um, and what I prayed for, because I prayed for what I needed, but she, he is everything that I wanted. And you realize that the things that you thought you wanted um, are not that deep and not that important anymore. But the things that you need that God uh, is a, that's aligned with what God knows you need becomes super important, super, super highlighted and that person fulfills that. So that's my share. Thank you. Understood. I forgot I muted myself. Thank you, Denise. That was that was awesome. Thank you for sharing. Lisa. Hey Tishan, thank you for the, the presentation earlier. Um I just wanted to touch a little bit about like um just self-assessing um yet your emotional intelligence and when is the pendulum swung too far when you're trying to correct? So for example, you mentioned earlier that you tend to kind of say what's on your mind. And I, I kind of, that resonated with me because I do the same thing. And um, years ago I decided to, you know what, Lisa, let's, let's find a way to um, kind of filter that a little bit in a way where you can still speak your truth, but at the same time speaking in truth and love. And so it gotten, has gotten to a point where if I am around people or a person that really is very inconsiderate or rude or negative, um, and I'm kind of stuck around that person, say for like a workplace environment, a colleague, I've learned like if this person isn't speaking truth or love to just kind of just not interact and not engage. And um, I actually get to. Uh oh, Lisa, you got on mute all of a sudden. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I don't know what's the last thing you heard. Oh, it was just for a split second. So you oh. said you tried to stay away from people, like if you have to be around like in a work environment and they're negative. Oh, yeah. So um, I, I just would keep to myself and I would be quiet. So to me, I feel like that is correcting it. But at what point is it too much, like the non-engagement or being quiet? When is it to the point where it now becomes negative? Because in my eyes, I'm trying to keep the peace. I, I know where I can go if I start, you know, responding to every negative comment or ne every negative action. So I, I choose to disengage. But at what point do we find a happy medium? Uh -huh. So um, uh, anybody's welcome to, to, to share. I'll tell you what, what my experience has been. Um, Cause one of the things that was hard for me about it was, um, you know, they have that, that's the song we heard, the Jeremiah shut up in your bones. <laughs> when God put something on my heart to say, it burns me literally up inside to keep it to myself. It's like, I don't have to worry about having the courage to open my mouth <laughs> because uh, it just burns me up. But because I grew up like that and that was part of my, you know, demeanor, um, when it necessary, when it was just what was on my heart in general, even if it wasn't God, if it was something that I felt like needed to be said, my stomach would start hurting. <laughs> like, and so I always felt like I was swallowing like, like something bad if I didn't say it, because it was usually like maybe not even something that was happening to me, but it's hard for me to see other people mistreat other people. Um, so I just especially in the workplace, what I try to do is I try to phrase things in a way that's more like a verbal shake. Because sometimes people don't realize how they're looking or how they're showing up. Like they don't, because they're so fixated on whatever it is they're talking about, the situation, the person, whatever, that they don't realize their impact or how they like I was saying earlier about those um the ripple effect and so 
asking them a question that can like maybe they don't see it the way that everybody else is seeing it and you and not telling them but asking them makes them think about it and they they're like oh I didn't think about it that way um and it'll you know cause them to take to to pause and and to reassess if it's not that way and it's just that they have been because I've been in that situation too where um they now feel like they have license to have this behavior because no one has checked it the people that are responsible like their supervisor or you know chain of command whatever has just kind of let it go um some some people are very non-confrontational so they'll just let a person continue and they'll just continue to get bolder and more and more bold in their behavior. And um, because nobody saying anything is almost as if everyone is agreeing to it being okay. And, um, and so those times it depends on how I think it's going to go, like what's going to be more effective. So if I think I can pull them aside, like, let me talk to you for a minute. <laughs> so like if I talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, um, I, I will. And, and, you know, you kind of have to gauge what people care about. So if they care about what everybody else thinks, then just simply telling them, you know, the way that you're coming off to people, people don't want to associate with you or your, um, reputation, you know, different things like letting them know, these are the things that are being said behind your back. People aren't telling you, but this is what's being said. Or, um, and then they have the op option to change what they're doing. Or if it's not a situation where you can pull them aside, just um, it, it's very situational, but, at, but, but just posing a, a question or making a statement that kind of interrupts their flow. Um, like you got some people that totally disrupt, disrupt the meeting. Or if it's like a family gathering, they just totally, you know, turn the whole mood or whatever. And so sometimes just saying something, it may not have anything to do with it, may be totally off topic, um, will just interrupt that flow of negativity with something that's positive or something that's redirecting everyone to something else. And then somehow because they don't have the attention that's if that's what the reason is is because they want the attention because they lose the attention it's almost like they fade out even though they're still there they just kind of fade into the background um but the key is like knowing what it's about um and that again that's only if you uh want you feel the need to to do something if you don't and you just, you know, don't want to deal with it at all. I mean, you can always talk to someone else like, hey, so-and-so <laughs> they're bringing, because I've done that too. I've told my supervisor when it was, you know, a, a, a group situation, like they're bringing everybody's morale down. You need to deal with them. That's a problem. <laughs> you know, sometimes people don't realize it until you tell them that, yeah, so you you feel like it's okay, but it's not. And it's, it's bad impacting everyone else um and then you know of course they can deal with it um but i believe that if god if, if something is on our heart if, if something affects us everything doesn't affect you so there's a reason why that thing affected you that is the reason why that thing is kind of you know giving you that thorn in your side type, type of feeling and so then it's just a matter of figuring out what you're going to do about it. Um, sometimes it's a cry for help. Sometimes that person needs someone to talk to and no one wants to talk to them because of how they are. And um, so if it's a person like this in my, you know, reports to me or someone that, you know, is uh, at the same level as me, or if it's a family member or a friend, then I'll just, you know, pull them aside and say, you know, I'll just like, hey, how you doing? What's, you know, like, are you, are you good? What's going on with you? And sometimes it just takes showing that compassion because people are, you know, not, ne they're not negative for no reason. If I can use that many negatives in a sentence. So um, there's something behind it. They're hurting, they're angry, they're frustrated, they're desperate. There's something going on. 
And if you can find the compassion to be that person, to listen, to have the empathy, to just be a sounding board in that moment, it could make all the difference. Um, but the, the short answer is to pray about it <laughs> and um, and see what God leads you to say or do. Um, and uh, And pray to have the the mindset to carry it out. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Natalie. Hey. Hey, Natalie. I, hey, I've just been listening, but um, I guess I can comment to Lisa. I uh, would say that you should evaluate the situation and determine like which does you more harm does it does it do more harm to not say anything versus saying something and if you feel like it does you more harm not to say something of course i'm sure there's a way you know how to say it to address um the situation um and then yeah so i, I think that's the way i normally do it um. Yeah, I think that's all I have to say when it comes to that. But I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation so far today. Thanks, Natalie. I, no I knew you have something to add. <laughs> no problem. Okay, guys, let's um pray out. Um, and I ask, uh, I ask okay. Keisha to do it. Okay, cool. Go ahead, Keisha. Well, maybe she can't do it right now. Okay, there she goes. Oh, me. Sorry. <laughs> I must have missed that ask. <laughs> uh, no problem. It's okay. Heavenly Father, we just thank you just for allowing us to be here um, today. Thank you, Lord, just for Tashawn. Just, she prepares so well, Lord, and how she just continues to just deliver your word and just to continue to draw us closer to you. Um, and everything that she does, every presentation is always pointing us back to you um, and how we can find ourselves and our true identity in you. Father, any one of us that may be struggling, um, Lord, we just ask that you continue to help us, continue to give us the words, the wisdom, um, continue to be with us, continue to watch over us, help us, to, Lord, to um, remember, Lord, that we are your children first and foremost, and extending the grace and the love that you have extended um, to others. We know that in this world, we are going to have trial, but we know that you have overcome it. And because of that, and because we are your children, we know we take it to you that is already done. Father, again, I just thank you just for allowing us to be here on today. Thank you, God, for watching over each and every one of us, um, even the ones who are not here. Keep them protected. Um, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Keisha. Amen. Thank you, Jazz. Uh, does anyone else have anything they'd like to share or ask? I do. Um, in terms of, um, in, ter in terms of how you talk to people, um, when confronting them or whatever it is that you're trying to do, just, um. Key onto the emotions, you know, make sure they're not getting aggravated or anything like that. And make sure you're not trying to aggravate them while you're speaking to them because that can just trigger all sorts of negativity. And you don't want that. Mm -hmm. So when I talk to people, you know, I try to key into that and everything else. And when they need to be confronted, you know, you just need to put the message out there. 